Chivalry, however it is defined, is associated first and foremost with the estate of knighthood and with fighting on horseback. The word knight, though Germanic in origin, carries the same meaning as the French chevalier, a knight, and both are connected with cheval, a horse. Chivalry, the nearest contemporary approximation to chivalry, carries with it resonances of skill in the art of horsemanship. The arrival in England of chivalry in the sense of fighting on horseback can be dated very precisely. It was introduced by the Normans in 1066. In the period before the Norman invasion, the English do not appear to have employed this technique. At the Battle of Hastings, as in every other conventional set-piece military encounter, they fought on foot. The difference between the English fighting style and that of the Normans can be seen clearly in the Bayou Tapestry. The two lines of soldiers in the battle scenes are virtually indistinguishable in terms of attire. They both wear male hauberks with short sleeves and conical helms with long extensions over the nose. Where the two sides can be told apart is in their deportment and tactics. The English are shown fighting on foot, wielding axes, while the Normans fight on horseback, wielding lances and sometimes swords. The sharply contrasting military traditions of the two sides influenced their whole approach to warfare. In battle, the English had been accustomed to lining up in a strong defensive formation. At Hastings, therefore, Harold arrayed his men along the full length of a wide south-facing ridge. The Normans, on the other hand, tended to think more in offensive terms. The mobility given to them by the use of mounts allowed them to use shock tactics against their adversaries. At Hastings, after his infantry had failed to dislodge the English, William finally secured victory when his knights lured the English down the hill using the ruse of the feigned retreat, then turned on their pursuers and destroyed them. It is not altogether clear why the English had failed to develop the skills of cavalry warfare. Culturally, they had close connections with Normandy and many of the English elite, like Harold himself, would have witnessed Norman knights in action. It is hardly as if the English were not practiced in the arts of horsemanship. They regularly used horses for rapid movement on campaign, and in Anglo-Saxon society, costly mounts were valued as symbols of status. Once on the field of battle, however, it was their practice to dismount. It is possible that this choice of tactic was related to their training in the main battle weapon they used, which was best wielded on foot. However, of greater importance, perhaps, was the fact that the adversaries they most often encountered, the Danes or Vikings, themselves fought on foot, offering little incentive for the development of new tactics. If the Norman conquest brought with it a new way of fighting and an assertive new ruling elite, it also brought a new code of honor, a more humane set of values governing the conduct of war. With the Normans came chivalry in the sense of an aristocratic ethic of restrained behavior, an assumption on the part of the elite that they would treat one another with respect. In the period to 1066, the English had shown themselves exceptionally brutal in their treatment of losers in war and civil strife. Noblemen who found themselves at the mercy of their opponents had to reckon with the prospect of death or mutilation. By the late 11th century, that was not the Norman way of doing things. The Norman Revolution involved not only a revolution in military technology, it also involved a revolution in the conduct of war. The English found themselves the beneficiaries of a medieval proto-version of the modern Geneva Convention. The point can be illustrated by looking at two incidents which occurred soon after the conquest. The first took place at Dover, when William was in the process of subduing the port after his victory. On the arrival of the Norman army at the town, the English defenders, demoralized by news of Harold's defeat and death, decided immediately to capitulate, despite the natural strength of the position they were defending. As they were about to yield, however, some Norman troops eager for booty set fire to the town. The Duke, noted his biographer, William of Poitiers, not wishing those to suffer who had begun negotiations with him for surrender, paid for the rebuilding of their houses and made good their other losses, and he would have severely punished those who had started the fire if their numbers and base condition had not prevented their detection. Duke William's name is not usually associated with compassionate treatment of the English in the years after the conquest. 
In his conduct of hostilities, however, he behaved humanely. He imprisoned, but he rarely executed, and ensured the security of the non-combatants in his power. The second incident occurred in 1068, when William was subduing the last embers of English resistance in the West Country. The citizens of Exeter had risen in rebellion, rejecting his rule and refusing to give him their fealty. William immediately set off for the southwest, and the citizens, hearing this, sent a delegation to meet him and to offer hostages. As William drew near with his army, they had second thoughts. Worried about possible Norman retribution, they retreated behind the walls and resumed resistance. William, infuriated by this volte face, ordered one of the hostages to be blinded in view of the defenders. The siege came to its inevitable end not long afterwards. Once William's men began mining the walls, the inhabitants knew that they would have to give in. Accordingly, they surrendered, coming out with their books and treasures, and threw themselves on the king's mercy. William pardoned them, refrained from seizing their goods, and posted a strong and trustworthy guard at the gate, so that the rank and file of the army could not break in and loot the city. William was simply applying the rules of war with which he had become familiar in Normandy. Once a formal surrender had been made, the citizens should be accepted into the king's peace and protected from pillage. There was no possibility that the Norman soldiery would be allowed to plunder and take booty. The Norman's attitude stands in stark contrast to that of the English, who had always been used to taking the lives of those they had defeated in war. When Harold Godwinson had overcome Hardrada and the invading Norwegians at Stamford Bridge in 1066, he put the fleeing survivors to the sword without mercy. A century before, his predecessors had acted in the same way towards defeated Vikings. The sequel to a pitched battle had invariably been wholesale slaughter of the survivors. There was no question of the exercise of mercy. The fact that the Vikings were usually pagan doubtless encouraged and, to some extent, legitimized this policy. Yet the English were no less ruthless in their treatment of their fellow nationals on the losing side in domestic disputes. Internal feuding and political competition were invariably accompanied by bloodletting. In 1016, when Earl Uhtred of Northumbria submitted to Knut, offering hostages for good conduct, he was nonetheless executed. Twenty years later, when Alfred Etheling, Ethelred II's son, was arrested by Godwin, King Harold's father, he was so badly mutilated that he died soon afterwards. In 1041, when Earl Edwulf approached King Harthicknut under a safe conduct, the king broke the terms of his promise and had the earl killed. The conduct of English queens in their treatment of foes was no better. In 1064, Edith, Edward the Confessor's queen, had Gospatric, an enemy of her brother Tostig, tricked and killed at her husband's court. Brutality was woven into the fabric of Anglo-Saxon political life, where the notorious King Ethelred had led, early in the century, with the St. Brace's Day Massacre of the Danes in England, his kinsmen and associates, English or Anglo-Scandinavian, followed. Such behavior was part of the tradition in which English aristocrats had been brought up. It was their way of doing things, but it was not the Normans' way. The Normans were no less rough, tough, and aggressive than the English yet they did not routinely resort to savagery in their treatment of well-born opponents. The reason is, in large part, to be found in developments which had occurred in continental warfare in the earlier part of the 11th century. The nobility and knights were by this time beginning to appreciate the value of treating one another in such a way as to permit mutual self-preservation. The reason for this was, paradoxically perhaps, that on the continent warfare was far more widespread than in England. In northern France and the surrounding areas of Normandy, Brittany and Anjou, at the turn of the millennium, disorder was endemic. Lords and castellans were constantly fighting one another, jostling for supremacy, position, and power. The extensive construction of castles led to more protracted campaigning as military outcomes were increasingly determined by drawn-out sieges. In circumstances like these, it was in everyone's interest to agree a set of conventions which limited the impact of hostilities on participants and their followers. An escape route had to be found from what was rapidly becoming a Hobbesian world in which life was nasty, brutish, and short. 
The informally agreed solution was to trade property, strategic assets, or political favor against the grant to a prisoner of his life. Through the offering of something of value in return for mercy, an incentive was given to a captor to spare a prisoner in his grasp, although there was never any prospect of a nobleman thinking twice before thrusting a sword into someone of inferior rank to himself. But for those with assets to trade or favors to grant, the new arrangements had the appeal of combining financial gain with self-preservation. Against this background, a body of conventions came into existence which limited the barbarism of war while allowing it to go on. Behind this development, however, lay a second change, one perhaps still more far-reaching, the rise of a money economy. A systematic regime of property exchange could only operate in a cash-rich society. In the early Middle Ages, this had not been the situation in Europe. The supply of money was actually contracting, and in some parts of the continent, there was a retreat to a barter economy. In the early 9th century, when Charlemagne had gone campaigning in Saxony, his aim had been to enslave captives, to make human beings his marketable commodity. By the late 11th century, however, Europe had begun to turn the corner, the days of contraction were over, and the economy was on the mend. Trade was expanding, new towns were being established, and the bounds of cultivation being pushed forward. People were buying and selling both locally and across long distances. In consequence, Europe was being transformed from a society of gift exchange into a monetized economy centering on market mechanisms. The effects of this seismic shift were felt not only in matters of consumption, but in values and social customs. War could be absorbed into the workings of a monetized economy with benefits to all who took part in it. And because those who led in war comprised the social as well as the military elite, the effects were felt more generally across society. A new ethic was called into being, which underpinned relations between the members of Europe's upper classes. And yet, as an ethic, this proto-chivalry was not actually as new as it seemed. There were elements embedded in the code which long predated the late 11th and 12th centuries, the qualities of prowess, loyalty, courage, and largesse, central to the later definition of chivalry, had been esteemed by Europe's warrior elites for centuries. In a sense, they were universal qualities. In all societies which have been dominated by military elites, whether in Europe or Asia, it has been the heroic qualities associated with leadership in war to which the highest respect has been paid. The martial qualities which define 12th century chivalry were precisely the qualities which had been celebrated centuries before in such poems as the Battle of Maldon, written C-1000. They were not so different in character from the heroic values and brave deeds celebrated in Beowulf and the Scandinavian sagas. A key element in 12th century chivalry was the emphasis on a knight's loyalty, the obligation on him to stand by his lord, to fight with him to the death. It is precisely this quality which is captured in the Battle of Malden. Faced by a Viking onslaught, the Ildorman Burtnoth dies surrounded by his military household, all of them preferring death to the ignominy of flight. What was novel in the years around 1100 was the grafting onto this ancient code of a range of qualities which softened and civilized the conduct of war. To the manly qualities of honor, courage, and prowess, were now added the humane ones of courtesy and magnanimity, mercy and generosity. A commander who in earlier times having captured a castle would have promptly dispatched the garrison, now granted them their lives. Once a formal surrender agreement had been made, he would allow the garrison free egress, release the castellan on condition of good behavior, and grant the prisoners their freedom. In this way, he would win praise for his actions enhancing his repute at the same time as encouraging imitation by others and promoting a currency of honorable conduct. The chronicler Orderic Vitalis, a perceptive observer of Anglo-Norman society, praised King William Rufus for going above and beyond the bounds of political prudence in his magnanimity to his enemies. Rufus's release of his enemy Helius of La Fleche in 1099 attracted the widespread admiration of those who wrote about his career. It was considered a great act of courtesy. A byproduct of England's absorption into the emergent world of chivalry was to heighten the sense of difference between the English, or Anglo-Normans, and the non-English peoples of the British Isles. 
Before 1066, socially and culturally, the peoples of the British Isles had all belonged to much the same sort of world. They all fought using the same tactics and the same weapons. Their warfare was marked by savagery and brutality. Their forces burned, raped and pillaged in campaigns of devastation. In battle, when they had rounded up their prisoners, they carried them off to slavery back home. Those whom they could not enslave, they immediately killed or mutilated. They neither gave quarter, nor did they show mercy or humanity to the defeated or innocent. Internal wars were conducted according to the same rough and ready rules. When one side gained the edge over the other, victory was accompanied by bloodletting and mutilation. By the 12th century, when the normalized English had renounced the inhuman methods of the past, the fighting of war in this way by the non-English peoples of the British Isles struck contemporaries as barbaric. Of the conduct of the Scots on their invasion of England in 1138, Orderic Vitalis wrote, A ferocious army of Scots invaded England with the utmost brutality and gave full rein to their brutality, treating the people of the borders with bestial cruelty. They spared no one, killing young and old alike, and even butchered pregnant women by savagely disemboweling them with their swords. Another chronicler, Henry of Huntingdon, wrote in a similar vein, accusing the Scots of murdering pregnant women, impaling children on their spears, and butchering priests at their altars. The Scots' conduct of war seemed to the English unnaturally cruel and barbaric. Their treatment of non-combatants caught up in hostilities came across as pitiless and scarcely Christian. The English chroniclers of the 12th century began to articulate a new view of the Celtic peoples as culturally inferior to themselves. William of Malmesbury, a writer exhibiting all the condescension of the literati, saw them as barbarians who lacked the polish and civilization of the English. Back in the age of Bede, five centuries before, the Celtic peoples had been admired by the English for their cultural achievements. By the 11th and 12th centuries, that was no longer the case. Culturally and economically, they had fallen behind their neighbors. Wales, Scotland, and Ireland lacked towns and cities, fairs and markets. Its people were poorer and more shaggy-looking, and their houses mere hovels. The English were conscious of their own increase in wealth and material prosperity, and their Celtic neighbors seemed underdeveloped by comparison. In the highlands to the north and west, the European monetized economy petered out, and in the non-English parts of the British Isles, the infrastructure allowing for the ransoming and exchange of prisoners hardly existed. In England, the attitudes and institutions of chivalry could develop. In the Celtic lands, they could not. If chivalry in one sense involved a revolution in the rules governing war, in another it involved a revolution in the actual fighting of war. Chivalry and the art of fighting on horseback went together. The words chivalry, Cheval and Chevalier are cognit, and chivalries was the collective term which contemporaries used to describe a group of mounted knights. The richly accountered knight was England's first cavalier. How had the rise of mounted warfare come about? And how did it lead to a social as well as a military revolution? The earliest references to European cavalry warfare are to be found back in the 6th and 7th centuries in the lands of the Frankish kings. The Franks, unlike most of their fellow Germanic tribesmen, appear to have mastered the technique of fighting on horseback. As early as 507 reference is made to them deploying mounted units on campaign. In that year, the Merovingian ruler Clovis published an edict regulating the taking of fodder and water for the use of his men's horses. In the 8th century, mounted units were a regular feature of the forces of the Emperor Charlemagne and his father. The emergence of cavalry encouraged the development of a social elite for one very straightforward reason. It greatly increased the cost of warfare, so that only the rich could then afford it. A mounted warrior needed a horse, and that was expensive. Ideally, he needed a second horse, lest the first was killed beneath him. He also needed ample numbers of servants, stable boys and esquires to attend to his own necessities and those of his horses. There was a further factor. A warrior needed, above all, the leisure time to devote to regular training and exercise, essential if he were to master the difficult art of fighting on horseback. By the 10th century, the knight's need for expensive, full-time training 
appears to have become so pressing that he was released from the daily grind of tilling the soil and was supported instead either by the grant of a piece of land tilled by a dependent tenantry or by the provision of residence in his lord's household. By itself, however, the rise of this new method of fighting would not have led to the appearance of the body of attitudes we associate with chivalry. The art of fighting on horseback, as we have seen, originated well before the development of chivalry in its mature form. More than cavalry fighting itself, it was developments in combat tactics which provided the stimulus to the growth of a culture which enveloped knights in mystique. In the second half of the 1000s, a new way was developed of using the lance as an offensive weapon. Until this period, the lance or spear had been used in any number of ways. It had been carried, gripped at roughly the point of balance, with the right arm extended so as to deliver an underarm blow. It had been carried high in the air to deliver an overarm thrust, as shown in the Bayou Tapestry, or it had been used as a projectile, hurled at the enemy from close quarters. To these well-established methods of delivery in the 11th century was added a fourth, horse, rider and lance, all gathered into what has been called a human projectile. Here, the knight, with his lance tucked tightly under his right armpit and his left arm handling the reins, would charge at his opponent to deliver a massive hammer blow at the moment of impact. If this lethal maneuver was to be effective, a much heavier lance would be needed. A light wooden lance would simply shatter on impact. The knight would also need a much more solid saddle bow if he were not to be swept from his seat by the shock of contact. All the essential elements appear to have come together in the second half of the 11th century. And when that moment arrived, the mounted warrior acquired an unprecedented level of destructiveness. He had become the Sherman tank of medieval warfare and commanded the marveling attention of contemporaries. At the same time, he found himself meeting yet more hours of training and exercise. By the early 12th century, he was beginning to find these in tournaments. It is no coincidence that around the time that these developments were occurring, we hear the first mention of these events. They were to become one of the central institutions of medieval chivalry, places where knights perfected their technique while simultaneously gaining in repute and developing a collective identity. The origins of tournaments are to be found in continental Europe in the late 11th century. The earliest such events appear to have been held on the borders of France and the Holy Roman Empire in the area of Valenciennes and Tournai. In 1095, in what may be the first reference to such a gathering, Count Henry III of Brabant is reported to have been killed in a joust before, before his household and that of the Castellan of Tournai, whom he was visiting. Early the next century, Count Charles of Flanders is said by his biographer to have enjoyed traveling to France with his knights to take part in tournaments in order to enhance his reputation and the power and glory of his county. Tournaments may have come into being as a byproduct of the so-called peace movement of the 11th century. At a time when reformist churchmen were struggling to curb the lawlessness of fighters in areas where princely authority was weak, organized fights provided knights with a way of refining their skills while technically remaining within the letter of the law. Early tournaments bore little if any resemblance to the carefully choreographed encounters of later centuries. The word tournament coined to describe such events, meaning to revolve or to whirl around, conveyed exactly what they were like. After the initial change, the knights engaged in a heaving melee, heave using their swords to unhorse members of the opposing team. The rise of the tournament coincided almost exactly with increased use of the technique of charging with the couched lance. The rough and tumble of the tournament provided ambitious young tyros with precisely the training they needed to master this challenging tactic. By the 1120s and 1130s, tournaments were being held at sites all over mainland Europe and in England. The keenest of the young bachelors, like William Marshall, made their round of the tourneying circuit every year, showing off their prowess while perfecting their fighting techniques. As the men engaged and bonded with one another, so they developed modes of thought and habits of conduct which bound them together as a group. 
they established a brotherhood in arms which transcended the ties of lordship, family, and ethnic identity. Tournaments can thus be seen as a key institution in both nurturing and sustaining the culture and the performance of chivalry. At the same time, they introduced young knights to the role which money could play in the regulation of military conduct. Early in the history of tourneying, a convention was developed that if a combatant was taken prisoner, he could secure his release by paying a ransom to his captor. It was also accepted that the captor was entitled to claim the armor and horse of his captive as legitimate spoils of battle. In these respects, the conventions of tourneying precisely anticipated the conventions which came to apply in the conduct of war more generally. A minority of those who made the round of the tournament circuit were wealthy aristocrats, the sons of kings or the lords of territories like Count Charles of Flanders. A much larger proportion, however, were men of lesser means who were looking to make a name for themselves. In earlier times, men of this sort would scarcely have been regarded as noble at all, they were considered merely free, inferior in blood to the better-born aristocrats. Such jobbing soldiers might enjoy a limited distinction because they were skilled in horsemanship, something which raised them above those who fought on foot. However, they hardly warranted mention in the same breath as the grander knights. In the course of the 11th century, this situation began to change. The lesser knights rose in status and esteem, attaining a rough equality with their betters. This major social shift proved the precursor to the final stage in the evolution of chivalry. When this last development occurred, chivalry in its fully developed form may be said to have arrived. The gradual rise in status of the lesser knights can be traced in the changing use of words miles meaning knight and dominus meaning lord. The one traveled down the social scale while the other traveled up. In the 11th century, dominus moved rapidly down the scale. Originally used to describe members of the elite, by 1100 it was being applied more widely, describing first barons and castellans, and later mere knights. By the end of the 12th century, quite humble knights were described as dominus in witness lists to charters. Miles, on the other hand, traveled in the opposite direction. A classical Latin word meaning soldier, entirely devoid of connotations of rank, it came to be applied to men who were considered domini. Miles was acquiring honorific associations which in earlier times it had lacked. As the martial values of prowess and courage with which it was associated spread throughout aristocratic society, so the title was applied to those in higher social levels. What this development indicates is that knighthood and social status were fusing together. The greater and the lesser knights were merging into a single group, clothing themselves in an elite identity which marked them from those in lower ranks. Why the social elevation of the Melites occurred is not altogether clear. One possible explanation is that it was linked to the spread of seigneurial castles across northern and central France, which was happening at this time. Castles were of little use to their owners unless they were staffed and defended by permanent and mobile garrisons. When members of the knightly warrior class took on garrison duty, they climbed a step or two up the social ladder. Typically, these men were provided with board and lodging in the castle, and perhaps also paid a fee. Living in close proximity to the Lord, they found something of that Lord's superiority rubbing off onto them. In status, if not in economic means, they acquired a degree of parity with the older nobility. The outward and visible sign of the formation of a single knightly class was its ceremony of admission. Knighthood, a form of chivalric Freemasonry, was equipped with its own initiation rite. The act of dubbing, or making, a knight is first recorded in the later 11th century. Outwardly, it had much in common with the ancient ritual of the delivery of arms to a young vassal on coming of age. Like the warrior of the early Middle Ages, the apprentice knight was invested by a senior knight or relative with a sword and belt, the symbols of his station. Around 1065, a young Norman knight, Robert of Rudlin, was girded with a sword by King Edward the Confessor of England, at whose court he was living. In 1086, the future King Henry I, a younger son of the Conqueror, was girded with hauberk, helmet and sword belt, by Archbishop Landfranc. In 1100 Count Folk of Anjou was to recall how, 
At Pentecost, forty years before, he had been girded with a sword by his uncle, Count Geoffrey of Anjou. What distinguished the knighting ceremony from the established giving of arms was the semi-ritualistic character of the later event. It was much more than a coming of age. The most impressive knightings could be occasions of some grandeur. John of Marmoudier gives this account of the knighting in 1128 by King Henry I of a later Geoffrey of Anjou on the eve of his marriage to Matilda, the king's daughter. On the great day, as required by the custom for making knights, baths were prepared for use. After having cleansed his body and come from the purified cation of bathing, the noble offspring of the Count of Anjou dressed himself in a linen undershirt, putting on a robe woven with gold and a surcoat of a rich purple hue. His stockings were of silk, and on his feet he wore shoes with little golden lions on them. His companions, who were to be knighted with him, were all clothed in linen and purple. He left his privy chamber and paraded in public, accompanied by his noble retinue. The horses were led, arms carried to be distributed to each in turn. He wore a matching hauberk made of double mail. To his ankles were fastened golden spurs. A shield hung from his neck, on which were golden images of lion cells. He carried a sword from the royal treasure, bearing an ancient inscription over which the superlative Wayland had sweated with much labor and application in the smith's forge. A generation later, the English scholar John of Salisbury gave an idealized description of another knighting in his Polycraticus. John saw his ceremony beginning in traditional fashion with the girding of the new knight with the belt of a soldier. At its climax, however, John introduced a novelty. John's knight was to walk in solemn procession to a church, where he would place his sword on the altar, dedicating both himself and his sword to the service of God. It can hardly be supposed that all 12th century knightings took the elaborate liturgical form which John of Salisbury thought fitting. John's description represented more the aspirations of the ecclesiastical reformers of knighthood than day-to-day -day reality. For the most part, knightings remained firmly secular in character. On some occasions, however, they could be staged on a grand enough scale. Writing in the 1130s, Geoffrey Gaymar was to recall a mass knighting which King William Rufus had carried out at the feast inaugurating the new Westminster Hall at Whitsun, 1099. The knighting was so splendid, he wrote, that people will talk of it forevermore. The king dubbed men in such style that the whole of London was resplendent with knights. And what am I to say about such a feast? Simply that it was so magnificent that it could not possibly have been more so. By Gaimar's time, the knighting ceremony was beginning to mark the knight's entry into a charmed circle, his admission into the company of the blue-blooded. The knight was no longer a jobbing soldier, a mere warrior. He was on his way to becoming a figure of standing and status. In the mid to late 12th century, all the elements which were to coalesce in medieval chivalry gradually came together. Nobility, knighthood, and courtesy fused to create an aristocratic ethic which surrounded knights with charisma and mystique. In the early 1200s, men actually began to talk about chivalry. Chivalry was an aristocratic ethos which had its origins in the broad open landscapes of northern France and the Low Countries. In its embryonic form, it was introduced into England by the Normans after 1066. It was to attain its full flowering a century or two later in the cosmopolitan world of the Angevin and Plantagenet kings. In later medieval England, it was to become one of the decisive influences in the shaping of aristocratic culture. The Normans who introduced the new culture of chivalry to England were one of the most dynamic and assertive peoples of medieval Europe. In just a couple of generations, they not only conquered England, they established social and political ascendancy over much of southern Italy and Sicily, provided the leadership of the First Crusade, and were instrumental in the creation of the Crusader Kingdom in the East. In the British Isles, they carried William I's conquest forward across the Severn and the Wye into South Wales, while individual Normans settled in southern Scotland at the behest of King David I among them the ancestor of Robert Bruce. 
Wherever the Normans went, they took with them their religious and cultural values. From the Cheviots to the deserts of Syria, from the borders of Brittany to the toe of Italy, the Normans were agents for the dissemination of brave new ideas on how things should be done. The effect of the events of 1066 was to create an entirely new polity in northwestern Europe, a polity of unprecedented size and resources, the combined dominion of England and Normandy. The creation of this regional superpower naturally aroused the enmity and distaste of the kings of France. The dukes of Normandy were nominally vassals, feudal tenants. Back in the 1040s, Henry I of France had actually assisted the young Duke William in his struggle with his unruly barons. As a result of the conquest of England, however, the Duke was transformed into an overmighty subject, a potential challenger to French royal supremacy. Within ten years of 1066, it became a key aim of French policy to undermine the Norman position in France, to sever the link between Normandy and England altogether. The struggle between the two powers was to be a long and bitter one, and it was conducted by fair means and foul. Whenever there were dissensions within the Anglo-Norman or Angevin elites, the French exploited them ruthlessly. Before 1066, England had only intermittently been involved in continental military entanglements. Wars had generally been forced on her by invaders from without, usually from the north. In the wake of the Norman conquest, the position changed. The new realm was constantly engaged in war. There was no shortage of military activity to occupy the attentions of the new Anglo-Norman knightly class. England became a country geared to meeting the manpower, financial and logistical demands generated by the strategic needs of her new masters. The constant military pressure created an intense demand for knights, and the heyday of the Anglo-Norman rulers witnessed a seller's market for the professional mounted combat soldier. According to the chronicler William of Malmesbury, in England, King William Rufus's needs were such that sellers sold to him at their own prices and knights fixed their own rates of pay. The position was much the same on the other side of the channel, in Normandy. Rufus's elder brother, Duke Robert, who held the duchy, cast far and wide to find knights. When, by the mid-1090s, he found himself running short of money to pay their wages, he turned in desperation to his brother. Anxious to enlist on the Pope's great crusade to the east, Robert pawned Normandy to his sibling for 10,000 marks to finance his retinue. Knights seeking employment had no difficulty finding suitable openings in the Anglo-Norman world. According to William of Malmesbury, again, William Fitzosborne, a close ally of the Conqueror, was said to be almost reckless in the amount that he spent on knights. Among the rulers of the day, King William Rufus was particularly famous for his liberality. Suger, abbot of Saint-Denis near Paris and a shrewd observer of the contemporary scene, described Rufus as that wealthy man, a poor out of English treasure, a wonderful merchant and paymaster of knights. According to William of Malmesbury, once again, knights flocked to him from every region this side of the Alps and he bestowed funds on them lavishly. Liberality, a chivalric virtue, was also for Rufus, a virtue born of necessity. In the late 11th and 12th centuries, the successful ruler was the free spending ruler, one who had the means to hire and reward knights. The amount that Rufus spent on recruiting knights caused astonishment among his contemporaries. In 1094, he was described as showering gold, silver, and lands on the knights he weaned away from their allegiance to his brother Robert. In 1095, he sent his younger brother Henry, the future Henry I, to Normandy with ample funds to lure yet more knights to England. In 1097 and 1098, he took knights into his pay from France, Brittany, Flanders and Burgundy. After he became king on his brother's death in 1100, Henry was just as lavish. In 1103, he entered into a treaty with the Count of Flanders whereby the Count, in return for an annual pension of 500 pounds, was to supply him with 1,000 knights in England against invasion or rebellion, 1,000 knights to serve in Normandy, or 500 knights in Maine. Renowned though they both were for the scale of their spending on knights, neither Henry I nor Rufus actually showed much interest in putting their men to the test in battle. 
Henry fought just two field battles in the course of his long career, and Rufus none at all. Rufus usually achieved his ends by the more convenient, if less chivalric, tactic of bribery. According to William of Malmesbury, in 1088, Rufus secured the castles of St. Valery and Omal in Normandy by his usual methods, by bribing the men in charge. 6. Henry was resourceful in a slightly different way. In the words of the same chronicler, Henry preferred to fight with policy rather than with the sword. He triumphed, if he could, without spilling blood. Contemporary thinking on strategy was anyway skeptical of risking all in an armed engagement. The outcome was too uncertain. In reality, neither king found himself often needing to resort to arms. He could achieve virtually all he wanted by relying on the sheer power of his reputation. The knowledge of his wealth and his capacity to hire mercenaries was enough to make an adversary think twice before taking him on. Where did all these mercenary knights come from? Certain areas proved especially fertile as recruiting grounds. Many knights came from the poorer pastoral peripheries of the Norman Angevin Empire, such as Wales and Brittany. According to William of Malmesbury, Henry I employed Bretons because those people are so poverty-stricken in their homeland that they earn their pay by gold in service abroad. The large and increasingly overcrowded cities of Flanders also proved good recruiting territory, as Henry I's treaty showed. Flemings were employed by the rebels of 1173 to 1174, and by King John in the winter of 1215 to 1216 in his campaign in the north of England. William of Ypres, King Stephen's main mercenary captain, was a Fleming. Towards the end of the 12th century, soldiers from Brabant, adjoining Flanders, figured with particular prominence in the armies of the Angevin and French kings. In 1174, Henry VI crossed from France to England to confront his adversaries with a mounted retinue and a crowd of Brabanters. In 1191, a force mobilized on Richard I's behalf by his chancellor in England, William Longchamp, included Brabanters and hired Flemish mercenaries. One of Richard's most celebrated commanders in the East was his mercenary captain, Mercadier, the so-called Prince of the Brabanters. A good number of the knights taken on by the Anglo-Norman and Angevin kings were retained as permanent members of the king's household. The king's extended household was, in one of its guises, an essentially military body. In the administrative records, it was usually referred to as the Familia Regius to distinguish it from the Domus, the more courtly establishment ministering to the king's domestic needs. By the time of Edward I, it was a body of several hundred men mostly knights and esquires, the numbers expanding and contracting in line with the king's military commitments. The household provided the core element of all the king's armies. In 1298, when Edward I launched a major invasion of Scotland, the household provided no fewer than 800 men, over a quarter and perhaps as much as a third of all the cavalry. In a very real sense, the English army was simply the king's household in arms writ large. The situation in Edward I's reign corresponded in all essentials to that of the late 11th and 12th centuries. At the heart of every royal army in the Anglo-Norman and Angevin periods were the knights of the king's household. Orderic Vitalis, a chronicler with a special interest in military matters, provides many insights into the organization of the army in the campaigns of the Anglo-Norman period. He says that in the War of St. Suzanne in Normandy, which stretched over the years 1084 to 1086, the conqueror left the task of mopping up resistance in neighboring Maine to the troops of his household. In his account of Rufus's reign, he tells us that the king's household was active in the campaign in the Vexen, which followed the king's acquisition of Normandy from his brother, and that it supplied garrisons for castles in Maine. For the long reign of Henry I, he provides more detailed comment. Orderic says that members of the household were active in the campaigns of 1105 and 1106, which led to the king's decisive victory over his brother at Tinchebray. He also records that the household played a key role in the campaigns of 1118 and 1119 against the king of France and Robert's son, William Clito. He shows how the king's household knights were used to provide manpower for castle garrisons, explaining that, 
when King Henry was suppressing a rebellion led by Walleran, Count of Milan, he dispersed his household men across castles at Gisors, Evra, Bernay, and elsewhere. Occasionally, Orderic provides an indication of the numbers involved. He says that in 1119, there were 200 knights in one detachment of the household, suggesting an overall strength considerably higher. In his account of 1124, he reports that 300 knights, supported by horsed archers, were mobilized to deal with a rebel force led by Count Walloran. It is likely that many of the household knights were mercenaries with little or no land to their name. A few at least, however, were quite senior men. On Orderic's evidence, Alan the Red, Count of Brittany, William de Warren, Richer, and Gilbert de Lagle, all magnates of high rank, served for spells in a household capacity. Men of this standing would have acted as court commanders, leaders of the contingents which provided the backbone of the larger royal army. Although rich and well-born, they would have seen nothing demeaning in serving at the king's command. On the contrary, they would have regarded it as a path to chivalric distinction and a convenient means of gaining access to the king's ear, the fountainhead of patronage and favor. The armies of the Anglo-Norman and Angevin kings were thus highly professional bodies kept in the field by a steady flow of money from the royal treasury. Yet it has often been thought, largely on the evidence of Domesday Book, that the true basis of knightly obligation in this period was not money, but land. A picture has been painted of knights serving in the royal host in return for grants of lands from superiors, part of which they might in turn grant to subtenants and there is certainly evidence that feudal contractual structures of landholding were crucial to the functioning of society in this period. The reciprocal ties of sponsorship and service forged between lord and vassal were to form the basis of all landholding law for a long time to come. What is not so clear, however, is the proportion of knights in the king's host provided through this system of landed obligation. The provision of knight's service finds surprisingly little mention in the writings of Orderic Vitalis, William of Malmesbury, and the other chroniclers, and Orderic for one was particularly attentive to matters of military organization. It seems on the whole more likely that the Anglo-Norman and Angevin kings chose to meet their needs from a pool of professionals on whom they could call rather than from feudal tenancies. In the Fayild, highly trained mercenaries or household knights would always be of more value to a commander than ill-trained or ill-equipped part-timers. If feudalism as a contemporary reality had little in common with textbook theory, it is nonetheless unwise to dismiss it as a mere figment of the historical imagination. The quotas notionally provided by feudal landholdings were actually of very considerable value to the king. Commuted for cash, they could be a lucrative source of revenue to the king's treasury. Feudalism is most convincingly understood as a rich, almost infinitely exploitable nexus of financial privileges. At every point in the feudal landholding structure, there was a right or obligation which could be turned into money. As early as 1100, it is recorded that the king was taking money payments in lieu of personal military service. Henry I, in his coronation charter of 1100, disavowed his predecessor's collection of skewage though he was soon to go back on his promise. Other payments could be released from the rights of ownership which a lord retained over an estate after he had granted it to a tenant. When a feudal tenant died and his son took his place, the lord was entitled to a sum known as relief, a succession duty. In the event that a tenant died, leaving a son under age, the lord was entitled to take his lands into temporary custody allowing him access to the income of the estate for the duration of the minority. If the tenant died, leaving not a son, but a daughter or daughters, the lord could make money from the sale of the marriages, or alternatively use the daughter's marriages as a source of patronage. Should he find himself faced with an emergency need for cash, for example to pay for a knighting ceremony, feudal custom also allowed him to levy a tax known as an aid on his tenants. In all these ways and others, feudal tenurial structures could be made to yield money for those fortunate enough to have tenants holding from them. The system was of the greatest value to the greatest lord, the king. As the person at the apex of the feudal pyramid, 
the king could also profit from his subjects' needs by charging for the various privileges and perquisites they were always seeking. If money raising under the Normans and Angevins looks more like a system of irregular plundering than a modern system of public taxation, it still worked. It provided the king with an effective way of securing his share of the huge wealth of the upper classes. In the 12th century, the revenues yielded by such payments could be very considerable. In 1129 to 1130, the first year for which figures survive, Henry I's exchequer accounted for receipts of 23,000 pounds, a massive sum by the standards of the day. Of this amount, just over 11,000 pounds was accounted for by the king's lands, and an astonishing 10,000 pounds by feudal windfalls and other incidental payments. Among the receipts in this latter category were sums of 1,000 pounds for an agreement with the king paid by Robert Fitzwalter, and 1,000 marks paid by William de Pont de Larche for the marriage of Robert Moduit's daughter and the office of King's Chamberlain, which Robert held. To these incidental sums could be added the yield from the geld, which was likewise very considerable, albeit by the 12th century in decline. Kings used the income from this assortment of sources to hire the best knights available, the professionals who made their living from soldiering. The renown of such knights ensured that their names would be well known to the king and his household officers. Usually, they had made their reputations on the tournament circuit. The most celebrated knight of the late 12th century, and certainly the most familiar to us today, was William Marshall, the younger son of a baron who rose to be regent of England in the minority years of Henry III. Shortly after his death in 1219, the marshal's life story was written up as a poem at the dictation of an esquire in his service. It opens a remarkable window onto the world of chivalric values at the turn of the 12th and 13th centuries. William Marshall was born around 1147, the fourth son by his second marriage of John Fitzgilbert the Marshal, a middling baron with lands in Berkshire and the Thames Valley. At the age of about twelve, the boy was found a place in the household of his mother's cousin, the wealthy Norman baron William de Tan Carville, whose estates lay in the lower Seine Valley. The farming out of youngsters to others was standard practice in medieval aristocratic society. In 1167, William was knighted by his master and fought for him in a skirmish near the border. The next year he transferred to the service of another relative, his uncle Patrick, Earl of Salisbury. He was already gaining a formidable reputation as a tournier, regularly unhorsing opponents and taking prizes and ransoms. In 1168, his loyalty and skill on campaign in Poitou brought him to the attention of Henry VI's queen, Eleanor of Aquitaine. It was through Eleanor's patronage that in 1169 he was awarded responsibility for the training in arms of her son, the king's heir, Henry the Young King. Royal service was to be of crucial significance in promoting William's social advance, because it gave him access to perhaps prestigious knightly entourage of his day. Henry the Young King was a popular if highly impressionable young man. Each year he took William, his dearest friend, as he called him, as his companion on the tourneying circuit of northern France, spending freely of his allowance from his father as he did so. Service with the young king was not without its pitfalls and hazards. In 1173, the ambitious royal heir rose in rebellion against his father, and William appears to have got caught up in the struggle, although his biographer understandably says little of the episode. After 1174, when agreement was reached between father and son, restoring peace to the Angevin world, William and the young king threw themselves back into the tournament circuit. For the next decade, William regularly attended three, four or five tournaments each year, enhancing his reputation at the same time as growing rich on prize money. By 1180, he had the means to maintain his own establishment of knights. The sheer scale of his success aroused jealousy among his less talented rivals. In 1182, as criticism mounted, some malcontents leveled accusations against him of feathering his own nest at the expense of his employer. For a year or so, he was banished from the young king's household, and he had to seek a livelihood with other lords. Before long, however, he was welcomed back. In 1183, 
he was at the young king's side when the latter died at the castle of Martel on the Dordogne. It was to the marshal that the dying prince entrusted the sacred charge of going on his behalf on crusade to the Holy Land. From 1184 to 1186, William was in the Latin East, waging war against the infidel. On his return, he was awarded a position in the household of the king himself. This was another crucial appointment. At the king's side, he had immediate access to the fountainhead of royal favor. In 1189, when Henry II died, he managed apparently effortlessly the transition to the regime of his successor, Richard the Lionheart, and scooped up yet more rewards. Shortly after the new king's accession, William was granted a prize of almost unimaginable value. Secure in landed wealth, he was set on the path that would take him to a position of supreme importance in national affairs and ultimately to the regency in 1216. In twenty years, William had risen from obscurity to the very top of the feudal aristocracy. The foundations of his remarkable career were found in the specific circumstances of the time. In the later twelfth century, it was perfectly possible for a talented young knight to turn a career in errantry into a career in royal service. Sideways switches of this kind posed no problem in a socially fluid world where men could move freely between households and across the frontiers of lordships and polities. Undoubtedly, luck played a part in the marshal's ascent. He seems always to have been in the right place, in the right company, at the right time. More remarkable still than his good fortune, however, was his vaulting ambition. He was immensely competitive. He played to win. In tournaments he mastered one of the most difficult tactics of the day to attract and impress the crowd. More than most tourneurs, he aimed to make money from his exploits on the circuit. At a tournament at U in Normandy in 1178 or 1179, he seized as many as ten horses from his victims as prizes. Over a two-year period in the 1180s, he and a partner took captive no fewer than 103 knights. At Onnet in Normandy in 1179, he preempted a group of fellow tourneyers by immediately accepting the surrender of some knights sheltering in a barn, thereby depriving his companions of any chance of a ransom. William Marshall was endowed with virtually all the qualities which contemporaries esteemed in a knight. He had the soldierly virtues of courage, strength, vigor, and boldness. At the same time, he possessed the complementary qualities of charm, courtesy, and affability, he made the consummate courtier, yet alongside the many attributes which attracted admiration, he had a hard-headed side. The generosity for which he was famed could sometimes be a cloak for naked self-interest. There is little sign that he was touched to any degree by the softer side of chivalry. Yet, despite the impression given by his career, there was no paradox or inconsistency in the values by which William set store. If contemporaries associated courtesy with courts and courtliness, they also accepted that ambition and careerism could flourish in the same setting. Some 12th century commentators regarded courts as places where men competed ruthlessly to climb the greasy pole. To recognize this is not to suggest that polite behavior among knights was necessarily artificial or contrived. Politeness came naturally to men who frequented courts. The qualities which brought fame and wealth to William Marshall were displayed still more clearly in the person of his patron, Richard the Lionheart. In the eyes of most of his contemporaries, Richard was quite simply the greatest princely ruler of his day. On the Third Crusade, he completely overshadowed his fellow ruler, King Philip II of France. He attracted the admiring attention even of his Arab enemies. Ibn al-Athir paid tribute to him as the most remarkable man of his time. An energetic and ambitious ruler, he cut a figure not just on the Angevin, but on the European stage. Famously, he spent only five months of his reign in England, yet his influence on the development of kingship in England was immense. Almost without effort, he reshaped Angevin and English kingship in his chivalric image. It was against his style that the kingship of all England's later rulers was to be judged. His successors on the throne of England were placed under a heavy burden of emulation. Richard was born at Beaumont Palace, Oxford, in 1157, the second surviving son of Henry VI and Eleanor of Aquitaine. From an early age, he established himself as his mother's favorite. His relations with his strong-willed and assertive father were turbulent, 
Richard suspecting Henry of favoring his brothers. In 1173, Richard played a key role in the rebellion of Henry the young king against their father, which the king of France helped aggravate. In 1184, he rose in rebellion a second time, on this occasion over a plan to reapportion the Angevin lands to the advantage of his younger brother John. In July 1189, he was in rebellion yet again and in alliance with the French king when he received news of his father's death at Chinon. Despite his record of filial disloyalty, Richard succeeded to an undivided inheritance, encountering no opposition from rivals. The task to which he gave his immediate attention was that of organizing a large-scale crusade to the east. Two years before, Jerusalem had fallen to Saladin following the Latins' defeat at the Horns of Hatton. With this setback, the very existence of the Latin kingdom, established by the First Crusade in 1100, was called into question, and help was urgently needed. After a year's preparation, Richard set off in the summer of 1190 at the head of a well-equipped force, numbering at least 6,000 men. He took a land route across France to Marseille, where a fleet sent ahead from England awaited his arrival. From Marseille, he sailed down the west coast of Italy to Sicily, where he overwintered, and then on to Cyprus, which he conquered following a dispute with the local ruler. He dropped anchor off the great Muslim-held city of Acre in June 1191. Acre had been subjected to a half-hearted siege by a Christian army for over a year. Within a month of his arrival, however, Richard had reduced the place. The morale of the Christian forces, which had fallen to a low ebb, was immediately lifted. Richard's next aim was to attempt the recovery of Jerusalem. He realized, however, that before he could advance on the holy city, he needed to take possession of the coastline, essential if the delivery of supplies was to be assured. Accordingly, in the late summer of 1191, he embarked on a long march south down the littoral across barren, sun-scorched countryside to the city of Jaffa. Constantly harried by enemy cavalry, he scored a major victory over Saladin at Arsuf and arrived at Jaffa after a grueling 19 days on 10th of September. With his lines of communication secure, he could now think of advancing on Jerusalem. What concerned him, however, was that, even if he took the city, he would have difficulty holding on to it because his resources were inadequate and his supply lines very extended. In December, in appalling weather, he marched to within 12 miles of the city and gazed at its distant skyline. His army was eager for an assault, but he knew that even if he breached the walls, prolonged occupation of the city would be impossible. Reluctantly, he pulled back. The following year, after leading a foray deep into Egypt, he advanced on Jerusalem a second time. Again, he had to accept that an assault, however tempting, would be strategic folly. In September 1192, Richard opened negotiations with Saladin on a truce, reaching agreement on terms which guaranteed freedom of access for pilgrims to the holy places, and the following month embarked on the long journey home. Although Richard had failed in his primary objective of recapturing Jerusalem, he had nonetheless succeeded in stabilizing the crusader's state. The fact that the kingdom was to survive for another hundred years was due in no small part to his endeavors in the field. If Richard's achievements on crusade read like a Greek epic, the story of his journey back to Europe has more of the character of stage farce. One accident after another was to dog his steps. In late November 1192, he was forced by bad weather to abandon his passage across the Mediterranean and resort instead to the difficult land route across the Alps. Worse still, in December, as he was emerging from the Alpine foothills, he was arrested by his old adversary Leopold, Duke of Austria, who nursed a grievance against him from the crusade and handed over to the Emperor of Germany. For over a year, the terms of Richard's release were the subject of tortuous negotiations between representatives of the Angevin and imperial governments. At the beginning of the 1194, however, a ransom of no less than 100,000 marks was finally agreed. Arrangements were set in motion in England to raise the money, and in February, Richard was set free. Once back in his dominions, Richard embarked on the massive task of recovering the territories which had been lost to the French in his years of absence. In the north and west of France, the situation was particularly serious. In Normandy, 
Philip had conquered most of the area east of the Seine. In Touraine and Poitou, he had taken possession of the castles of Loche and chatillon sur ande while in Aquitaine the barons had raised the banner of revolt. Richard set about responding to these challenges with energy. In May he stabilized the frontier in the Seine Valley and Upper Normandy, moving south to relieve French pressure on castles in Touraine. When he felt that he had strengthened his position sufficiently, he agreed to a truce with the French at Tilleries. The following year, the struggle resumed. In July or August, Philip destroyed Richard's castle of Vaudrel, south of Rouen, while Richard retaliated by attacking Philip's lands further south. In 1196, Richard and Philip reached an agreement at Louvius, whereby Richard recovered virtually all the lands that he had lost, except for border territories in Normandy. Philip, however, would not give up. In 1198, he returned to the fray, but Richard worsted him in an engagement at Gisors, in the course of which the French king was unhorsed and thrown into the river Ept. The contest between the two kings only ended when Richard was killed by a crossbow bolt at Chalus Chebrol in the Limousine in April 1199. Richard's military career was one of the most outstanding of the Middle Ages. Richard showed himself to be a brilliant commander, a master of the art of siegecraft, and a charismatic leader of men. He did not fight many battles because he did not need to. He could always rely on achieving his objectives by other means. In accordance with contemporary practice, he put his trust in the reduction of castles, the wasting of enemy lands, and the outwitting or outmaneuvering of his adversary's forces, rather than in the hazard of battle. But he was never lacking in bravery. Richard was a Napoleon of his age. His military genius was recognized across Europe and beyond. The effect of his reign in England was to strengthen the Angevin dynasty's identify Catayan with chivalric and knightly values. Richard's two most able immediate predecessors, Henry I and Henry II, had both in their different ways been very successful in arms. Richard's achievements, however, were of an altogether greater order. What distinguished Richard was that he made a virtue rather than a necessity of war. He showed how war, particularly crusading war, could strengthen and legitimize kingship. From his reign on, not only was the waging of war to figure more prominently in the expectations that people had of their kings, success or otherwise in arms was to be the test by which a king's exercise of his duties was to be measured. For Richard's successors, his was the career against which theirs would be judged. Richard's magic was to work its effect in various ways. In the first place, the memory of his achievements was to live on after him. His struggle in the East with his rival Saladin was to become legendary, with poems and tales written in celebration of it, and if Richard's genuine achievements on crusade were not enough, new ones were soon added to them. A story which gained wide circulation concerned a legendary personal encounter with Saladin. According to this yarn, Richard accepted a challenge from Saladin to a duel, riding a horse which had been given to him by his Muslim opponent. The gift was a trick. The horse was a colt born to the mare which Saladin was going to ride, and the plan was that when the mare whinnied, the colt would lie down, leaving Richard at his opponent's mercy. However, Richard was forewarned of the danger by an angel. Preparing for the duel by stuffing his colt's ears with wax, he entered the lists. When Saladin's mare whinnied and the colt did not react, Richard, taking advantage of his opponent's discomfiture, unhorsed him and chased him from the field. In 1251, Henry III was to commission a wall painting of the story to decorate a chamber of his palace at Clarendon in Wiltshire, and a series of floor tiles depicting the duel were laid at Clarendon, the Tower of London, and elsewhere. The episode quickly became popular enough to enjoy wide literary and artistic circulation. Another story which enjoyed wide popularity told of the king's captivity in Germany. Its origins concerned his nickname, which was a contemporary sobriquet. According to this tale, the king of Germany's daughter fell in love with Richard when he was in prison and spent some agreeable nights with him. When the girl's father learned of the liaison, he planned Richard's murder by having a hungry lion introduced to his cell. But Richard, armed only with silk handkerchiefs, was able to kill the lion by thrusting an arm down the beast's throat and tearing out its heart. To the period of Richard's imprisonment, 
also belongs the famous story of Blondel, the fictitious minstrel who is said to have discovered the king's whereabouts by singing songs outside castle after castle until at last he heard the king answering back. Legend gathered around Richard's name, it seems, almost spontaneously. Nonetheless, the growth of the subsequent cult owed more than a little to Richard's own encouragement. Richard was a master of the art of self-promotion, aware that his image needed careful burnishing and manipulation. He took care to keep his subjects well informed of his diplomatic coups and victories in the field abroad and was one of the first English kings regularly to use newsletters. Whenever he scored a major triumph, he made sure to publicize it. On his way to the East in 1191, he wrote to the justiciar William Longchamp, justifying his seizure of the Kingdom of Cyprus. Seven years later, when back in Normandy, he described his victory over King Philip and the French on the bridge at Gisors. These semi-official documents were circulated and copied into the chronicles. Richard also took care to ensure that his achievements were sympathetically reported by those accompanying him in the field. In the work of Ambrose, the minstrel who traveled with him on the Third Crusade, he secured a full and sympathetic account of his exploits in the East. Ambrose tells the story of how, when Emperor Isaac of Cyprus asked to be spared being fettered in iron, Richard fettered him in silver chains. The story, presumably fed to Ambrose, was one calculated to emphasize Richard's power and make him appear a new Caesar. Richard, with his eye for publicity, was well aware of the importance of the grand gesture. When he set off on the crusade, he took the sword Excalibur with him. By assiduous self-promotion, he ensured widespread support for himself and his dominions. In England, in the course of time, he became a popular hero. By one very practical measure, Richard strengthened the identification of the knightly class with his own values. He authorized the reintroduction into England of tournaments. Tourneying had been viewed disapprovingly by Henry VI, who had banned the activity in England on the grounds that it encouraged disorder. Accordingly, knights who wanted to gain fighting experience had been obliged to go abroad. In 1194, according to William of Newburgh, Richard reversed his predecessor's policy, introducing a system of licensing. Five places in England were designated official tournament sites. The Fylds between Salisbury and Wilton in Wiltshire, between Warwick and Kenilworth in Warwickshire, between Brackley and Mixbury in Northamptonshire, between Stamford and Wandsford in Lincolnshire, and between Blyth and Tickhill in Nottinghamshire. A fee was charged for a license to hold a tournament, and each participant paid according to his rank. According to William of Newburgh, Richard's purpose in encouraging tournaments was to improve the quality of the English knights so as to make them the equal of their French counterparts. So successful was the measure that within a decade or two, in the well-informed opinion of William Marshall, 30 English knights were the equal of 40 French. Through the enduring power of his reputation and through the efforts he made to disseminate his values, Richard became the agent of a major shift in English monarchical style. In the years after his death, the values of the English monarchy were increasingly shaped along the lines which Richard himself had championed. The sheer scale of his achievements across so wide a field brought luster to his line. At the same time, his achievements placed his successors under a heavy burden of emulation. Richard's style of kingship was considered the model to which all who came after him on the throne should aspire. Young kings, or kings to be from this time on, were judged by how far they lived up to his exacting standards. In the 1270s, after his accession, the youthful Edward I was greeted approvingly. He was said to shine like a new Richard. When in the next generation Edward II was held up for reproach, it was said that, had he practiced arms, he would have excelled Richard in prowess. In funerary eulogies, when tributes were paid to deceased kings, as to Edward I in 1307, it was conventional for the deceased ruler, providing he deserved it, to be compared to the lion heart in bravery. Richard had succeeded in raising the prestige of the Angevin royal line, and he had achieved this principally through his achievements in arms. By virtue of his influence, the English monarchy was gradually transformed into a chivalric monarchy. 
Chivalric values were henceforth the values with which the most successful of England's kings were to be associated. In medieval aristocratic society, chivalric activity and cultural expectation went hand in hand. The chivalric lifestyle of the aristocracy found its mirror in literature, just as literature found much of its inspiration in chivalry. In the romance writing lapped up by the aristocracy, the themes most commonly dealt with were the performing of brave deeds, the knightly quest for honor, and the love of a knight for his lady. These were themes with an immediate appeal to an aristocracy which defined itself as a military elite, but because that aristocracy was also a social elite, they found a wider audience among those influenced by elite tastes. Chivalric culture played a key role in shaping the culture of medieval society as a whole. This was true not only of literature, but also of architecture and the visual arts. The emergence of a distinct chivalric culture can be traced to the early 12th century. Europe was at this time experiencing an immense intellectual awakening. The most striking manifestation of this was the rediscovery, through Arabic translations, of some of the writings of Greek antiquity. Underlying and informing the new mood, however, was something deeper. European teaching of the early Middle Ages had emphasized the hopelessness of humanity's prospects on Earth. To early medieval writers, humans were fallen creatures whose fate rested with the Almighty. In the 12th century, that pessimism was gradually laid aside and thinkers invested humankind with a new dignity and a new power. Through the application of reason, it was argued, the individual human could understand the mind and will of God and bring order to his own experience. To such thinkers as Peter Abelard, the whole universe appeared intelligible and accessible, with humanity occupying a fitting place in it. At the same time, the deity himself was humanized and made more approachable, quite different from the terrifying god of judgment of earlier times. For women, a new role model was found in the Virgin Mary, whose cult was encouraged by St. Bernard and the Cistercians, and who was seen as a mediatrix between humanity and the Almighty. In literature, the new outlook of the time found expression in troubadour lyrics, which showed a range of tenderness and emotion altogether unprecedented in the poetry of the earlier Middle Ages. It was against this background that the emergent culture of chivalry took shape. Chivalry, tempered and refined by the new mood of the 12th century, transformed the knight from a mere warrior into an idealized figure. In earlier times, the warrior had been preoccupied with the struggle for survival in a fallen world. The knight of the 12th century was altogether freer and happier. He was given a role to perform in a divinely ordained hierarchy, that of protecting the other two orders of society, the clergy and the laboring classes. He was invested with nobility, good fortune, and charisma. Influenced by the 12th century cultural awakening, the culture of chivalry was richer, subtler, and more diverse than the culture of earlier centuries. It complemented heroism with a range of literary and artistic references that invested it with an emotional intensity which in an earlier age would have been inconceivable. In its broadest sense, English chivalric culture took four main forms. Three of these were related, the first, a fondness for the new literature of Arthurian romance, the so-called Matter of Britain, which attained its first flowering in the writings of Geoffrey of Monmouth, the second, a taste for Anglo-Norman romance, the vernacular poetry which conferred legitimacy on baronial aspirations by dealing with the exploits of local dynastic heroes and legendary figures in a family's past. And the third, a fascination with England's history, arising from the new aristocracy's appetite to learn more about its adoptive country. The fourth and last was different. This was the development of a language of visual symbolism, the most striking manifestation of which was heraldry. Together the four can be said to have formed the main elements of a culture marked by a liking for romance, heroism, and display. Although chivalric literature was to find its most characteristic expression in the stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, it did not have its origins there. Before the rise to popularity of the Arthurian genre, there was an earlier tradition of writing, the chansons de geste. 
The chances dealt with the familiar themes of honor, bravery, and struggle. However, they lacked the romantic ingredient of a quest for a lady. They stood halfway between the early medieval heroic literature and the later romance literature, into the common stock of which they were eventually to merge. The chansons de Geste took as their main subject matter the battles and heroic achievements of the Emperor Charlemagne and his paladins. They centered on three great themes. In the form in which they have come down to us, the chansons are mostly of early 12th century date. The traditions they drew on, however, originated in works of Charlemagne's own time in the late 8th and 9th centuries. Two of the cycles, those based on the Chanson de Roland and the Chanson de Guillaume, deal with broadly the same subject, the wars between the Franks and the Muslims in southern France and Spain in the 8th century. The Chanson de Roland, the finer of the poems, is built around two connected episodes in that conflict. Charlemagne's retreat from Spain and the death of his commander Roland, and Charlemagne's subsequent revenge on the manipulative Balagant and Ganelon, who were largely responsible for Roland's death. Ganelon, the story goes, was sent on an embassy to Spain after Roland had offended him and arranged for the Muslims to fall on the emperor's rearguard under Roland's command in the Roncesvalles Pass. Events unfolded entirely as planned. The Franks, on entering the pass, saw not one but five armies confronting them. Roland's close friend Oliver begged him to summon Charlemagne by blowing his great ivory horn. Roland, however, refused and fought alone, overcoming four of the armies and falling just before the fifth attacked. It is a story of bravery and faithfulness. Before long, the narrative had acquired its stock pantheon of heroes, with Roland the Valiant being contrasted with Oliver the Wise. Scenes from the story were represented in stone on the front of Verona Cathedral and in stained glass in an aisle window at Chartres Cathedral. The chansons took a real historical figure and spun around him a series of invented martial episodes. Fact and fiction were woven as warp and weft in the cycle. Roland, the supposed Duke of the Breton March, may or may not have had a real historical existence. Oliver apparently had none at all. In the body of literature which came to supplant the chansons, the Arthurian romances, the blurring of fact and fiction was taken much further. Arthur, an early British leader with a shadowy existence in the Welsh annals, was placed at the center of an exotic pseudo-historical fantasy world and credited, along with his knights, with a fictitious career of gallantry and brave deeds. The heroic Arthur was perhaps the most brilliant and original literary creation of the Middle Ages. He was the brainchild of an obscure Welsh clerk, Geoffrey of Monmouth, in his The History of the Kings of Britain, written in the 1130s. This was destined to become a medieval bestseller. Geoffrey claimed to have found the source material for his history in a very ancient book in the British tongue, given to him by his friend Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford. The appeal to an ancient source was simply an authenticating device designed to confer legitimacy on Geoffrey's supposed history. Geoffrey's book, written in Latin, was quite manifestly a work of fiction, as a number of his more sober-minded contemporaries, such as the chronicler William of Newburgh, pointed out. Geoffrey traced the history of Britain through a sweep of 1,900 years from Brutus, great-grandson of the Trojan Aeneas and founder of the kingdom, to the last British king, Cadwallader, who, harassed by plague and war, surrendered it to the Saxons in the 7th century. Brutus, according to Geoffrey, came to Britain following the fall of Troy, and after beating off the giants who inhabited the island, established his capital at London, which he called Trinovantium, or New Troy. After his death, the kingdom was divided between his sons, with Lugria, the part corresponding to England, passing through a succession of rulers, among them Bladid, the founder of Bath, and Lear, who foolishly trusted his daughters, until it descended to Uther Pendragon, the father of Arthur. At this point, Geoffrey let his imagination run riot. Arthur, he said, was born of the adulterous union, engineered by Merlin of Uther and Igerna, Duchess of Cornwall. At the time of his accession, Britain was under attack from the Saxons. Through Merlin's counsel and his own prowess, Arthur turned the tables on the invaders, driving them from Britain and pursuing campaigns of conquest in Scotland, Ireland, and Gaul. He was about to challenge the might of Imperial Rome itself 
when he heard of the treachery of his nephew Mordred, who had seized Queen Guinevere. Returning to England, he pursued Mordred to Cornwall and engaged him in battle, slaying him but suffering mortal injury himself. Carried mysteriously by boat to Avalon, he surrendered his crown to his nephew Constantine. Later, the British were driven back to Wales, but an angelic voice told a later king, Cadwallader, of the eventual return of the Britons and their recovery of the kingdom they had lost. Geoffrey found the raw material for his history not, as he claimed, in one ancient book, but in a whole variety of sources. Some of these were works of authority, such as Bede's Ecclesiastical History and the chronicles of the two British writers Gildas and Nennius. Others, however, were legendary. In the rich seams of Celtic mythology with which he was familiar, he was able to search for fictions which, reworked and suitably embellished, he could turn into an exotic story of national origins. Central to Geoffrey's literary ambition was the elevation of the British as a nation. He wrote against the background of a major resurgence of Welsh power, which in the 1130s saw two princes, Morgan and Iorworth ap Owain, sweep down from the mountains and establish lordships based on the previously English-held castles of Carolion and Usk. Morgan, who remained in occupation of Carolion for some twenty years, was actually to style himself on one occasion in a charter a king. Just when Geoffrey was penning his history then, there was once again a Welsh princely ruler holding court in the very place where, centuries before, Arthur himself had held sway. Geoffrey may have been responding to this mood of Welsh excitement and anticipation when he penned his description of Arthur's magnificent court at Carolion, at which he had received the homage of the subject princes of Britain. Geoffrey's readers were able to enjoy his history without necessarily subscribing to or even being aware of his Welsh agenda, which was largely hidden. For a good many of his contemporaries, the most noticeable quality of Geoffrey's work must have been its universality. It gave an account of English origins which set English legitimacy within the Virgilian context of the fall of Troy. Whatever his readers' understanding of his work, it certainly enjoyed an immediate popularity. It circulated in hundreds of copies and was paid the compliment of generating a massive secondary literature. A copy of it was owned by Walter S. Speck, Lord of Helmsley in Yorkshire and founder of Rievolx Abbey. In the 1140s, Geoffrey Guimar produced a French version to serve as the first part of his Estoile des Anglis. There were copies in cathedral and monastery libraries as well as in baronial halls and chambers. Interest in Geoffrey's work was as keen in continental Europe as in England, and he attracted an extensive following, not least among the Cistercians of northern France and the Low Countries. Part of the reason for Geoffrey's enormous popularity was that he offered his readers not so much a historical record as a mirror of their own times. He drew reassuringly on contemporary assumptions, attitudes, and ideas. In Geoffrey's history, Arthur's kingship was presented as a version of 12th century kingship. Arthur did all the things that 12th century kings did. He gave generous gifts and rewards to his knightly followers. He summoned a feudal host. He held ceremonial crown wearing at the great seasonal festivals. According to Geoffrey, Arthur made his court the international model for refined courtly behavior. The noblest men in Europe, he wrote, sought to conduct themselves in matters of dress and the bearing of arms in the manner of Arthur's knights. Much the same could have been said of the appeal to the European nobilities of the courts of William Rufus and Henry I. Likewise, Arthur's conquests evoked contemporary parallels. Arthur had conquered Gaul, Scotland, and Italy. Geoffrey's readers would have recalled William of Normandy extending his dominion over Brittany and Maine before taking on the conquest of England. Geoffrey took the familiar aristocratic world of his lay readers, but projected it back, making it altogether grander, more exotic, and more alluring as he did so. Geoffrey's history is perhaps best regarded as a version of a found action myth. The peoples of early medieval Europe had a longing for vivid historicizing accounts which explained and legitimated national origins. The history may be interpreted as one of the most impressive and successful of such narratives. Not only did it recount and explain, it also amused and entertained. Its original association with the British or Welsh was quickly lost sight of 
as it took on an overlapping identity with their neighbors, the English. The latter, uniquely among the peoples of the British Isles, actually lacked a foundation myth of their own. The best narratives which they could come up with were the stories of Hengist and Horsa in Bede. Conscious of their weakness in the historically aware 12th century, the English appropriated the cult of Arthur, adapting it to their needs. Thus Arthur was reinvented as an honorary Englishman. He was provided with an English burial place, Glastonbury Abbey. His court of Camelot was located in an English castle at Tintagel in Cornwall, and his sword Excalibur was mysteriously given into the hands of an English king, Richard the Lionheart. By the late 13th century, Arthur was clothed in his new identity as a champion of English chivalric kingship. In the reign of Edward I, his cult was made the means to mobilize the English knightly class in support of a new English-led bid to establish a British kingship. If Arthurianism developed in one direction as an English foundation myth, it developed in another into something broader and more cosmopolitan. By a process of literary osmosis, Geoffrey's stories of Arthur and his knights were turned into the genre of European literature known as the Matter of Britain. There were three matters which formed the mainstay of romance writing in the Middle Ages. With myths of Celtic origin already in circulation on the continent, Arthur quickly became a figure of broad international appeal. The treatment of Arthur by later writers differed in certain important respects from Geoffrey's. In Geoffrey's hands, the world of Arthur had been violent and masculine, in this regard, bearing the heavy imprint of the old chansons de Geste. His Arthur was constantly waging war, ravaging the countryside and slaughtering his enemies. Geoffrey showed little interest in the emotional life of his characters. Later, continental writers developed those aspects of his work which Geoffrey himself had left undeveloped. The role of women, for example, was expanded and given greater emphasis. Most important of all, new heroes were introduced. Where Geoffrey had identified only three of Arthur's knights by name, later writers were to mention others who had featured in ancient accounts, and they introduced an entirely new one, Sir Lancelot. Arthur himself was now overshadowed by those nominally in his service. It was the courtier knights on whom attention was henceforth to be focused, not the king to whom they owed allegiance. The first person to attempt a reworking of the history was the Jersey-born poet Wace, whose Roman Debrut, completed in 1155, was a loose vernacular translation of it. Wace was a pioneer in the imaginative use of Geoffrey's material. He adapted it freely, developed it in new directions and introduced new stories of his own. It was Wace who, crucially for the future, invented the round table, Arthur's ingenious device for seating his knights without provoking quarrels over precedence. Wace also shifted the balance of Arthur's conquests to outside England, thus locating him on both sides of the channel, not just in Britain. Wace may be said to have paved the way for the groundbreaking work of the French writer Chrétien de Troyes some twenty years later. Chrétien was perhaps the ablest and most significant of the French romance writers of the Middle Ages. Very little is known about his career beyond what he tells us himself. His five surviving romances are all highly original works, which show qualities of elegance, maturity, and inventiveness. Le Chevalier de la Charette broke new ground in introducing the story of the adultery of Launcelot and Guinevere into the Arthurian cycle while Le Comte du Graal attempted the first serious exploration of the Grail legend. Where earlier works had confined themselves to straightforward celebration of chivalric values, Chrétien subjected these to scrutiny, exploring such themes as love and adultery, actuality and aspiration, ambition and spiritual fulfillment. The sanguinary violence of Geoffrey's history was softened and toned down. In Chrétien's hands, the underlying assumptions of the new, more civilized aristocracy were subjected to searching analysis and debate through the works of Chrétien and through the 13th century collection known as the Vulgate Cycle, which brought together the stories of the Grail and the death of Arthur, the Arthurian corpus passed into the European literary mainstream. Yet Chrétien's own treatments of Arthurian themes appear to have aroused little enthusiasm in England. Only a few English texts, notably the Uwain and Gawain, directly reworked Chrétien's oeuvre. In England, 
Arthur's unique historical positioning appears to have had a limiting effect on the ways in which writers interpreted themes relating to his career. Arthur was seen not as a fictional or idealized creation, but as a real historical figure with an actual existence in the remote past. He took his place among the nine worthies or heroes, alongside the likes of Charlemagne and the crusader Godfrey de Bouillon. He was the hero of the nation. One 14th century Cornish knight was to claim that his ancestors had actually received their arms from the historical Arthur. Stories of Arthurian knighthood were accordingly treated less freely and in less abstract fashion than in France. They tended to be located in specific historical settings, whereas writers from outside England happily located the king in a variety of periods and settings. For English writers and readers, Arthur was a national hero, a kingly exemplar, a heroic figure from their nation's distant past. He had a specific place in the history of their country. He was a figure with significant local as well as cosmopolitan appeal. The rise of fictionalized histories like Geoffrey of Monmouth's formed part of a larger literary phenomenon which saw the production in England of epics and romances in French for a mainly noble audience. We have already seen how the 11th and early 12th century chansons digest, developed the idea of treating the career of a real historical character as a factual core around which to spin fictional narratives of bravery and heroism. In the next generation, Anglo-Norman romances were to rely on much the same technique. Using the poetic form, they took a real or imagined historical character and fashioned around him fanciful stories which would appeal to a noble audience. Geoffrey's original history had been written in prose chronicle form, which helped to give it the semblance of historical verisimilitude. The poetic form, which was often used for romance writing, allowed the creation of a more fictional atmosphere. The genre known as romance comprised the principal secular literature of entertainment in the Middle Ages. Less heroic than the guestes and epic narratives, and less lyrical than the Breton lays, it was a genre essentially recreational in function. Chaucer described it as the storial thing that toucheth gentilis. Its rise coincided with the emergence of a newly self-conscious courtly aristocratic ruling class in Northern Europe. It was this aristocracy whose members provided the main patrons and audience of the new genre. It was likewise the exploits and preoccupations of the aristocratic class, which provided its main subject matter. In England, the romance rose to popularity in the years after the Norman Conquest. This was a period of precocious development for Anglo-Norman literature. The scale of literary activity owed something to the multiculturalism of post-conquest England, to the meeting and intersection of two vernacular literatures, and the creative challenges to which this gave rise. It owed something, too, to the encouragement of a leisured and intellectually curious aristocratic patron class who were looking for literature that reflected their values and aspirations. If writers were sometimes tempted to refashion the outlook of their audiences through what they wrote, nonetheless, they had to write what their audiences wanted to hear. Among the most important 12th century romances are two by a clerk who lived in the Welsh border country. Juan's Epomedon, which he says he wrote at Creedon Hill near Hereford, is a poem of some 10,500 lines about a wandering knight, Epomedon, who undertook a series of adventures to prove his worth to his lady. Juan wrote a sequel, Protesilos, of nearly 13,000 lines, in which he told of the adventures of Epomedon's younger son. Juan's tales, which are set in Apulia and Calabria, are a heady mix of the familiar romance motifs of unrequited love, three-day tournaments, and unrecognized brothers. Serious issues are considered along the way, among them questioning of obsessive love, distaste for the violence of warfare, and exploration of personal identity. Juan, however, offers his observations in a humorous parody that verges on the burlesque. He tells us that he wrote Pertesilaus for Gilbert Fitzbatteron, Lord of Monmouth, who was related on his mother's side to the powerful de Clare family. Gilbert seems to have been typical of the enlightened patron class of the age. One tells us that he had a personal library in Monmouth Castle, which was well stocked with works in both Latin and French. Like Walter S. Beck of Helmsley, Gilbert delighted in listening to tales of the fabulous and amusing. Two other romances of the late 12th century, 
Bove de Hamtone and Waldef have English settings, respectively Southampton and East Anglia. Bove survives in two 13th century fragments, totaling 4,000 lines. An epic style romance, it tells how Bove, the 10 year old son of the Earl of Hampton, is deprived of his patrimony and sold by pirates to the King of Armenia, whose daughter he falls in love with, and how on his escape he returns home to recover his inheritance before dashing off again to rescue the lady from her abductors. The naming of Bove's horse, Arundel, suggests that the poem may have been written as a tribute to William Dalbini, Lord of Arundel. Waldef, incomplete but still running to 22,000 lines, likewise dwells on the theme of exile and return, in this case of an English king, but combines it with a parallel story of a divided family and a quest for lost sons. The narrative is lively and fast-moving, but also violent and immoral. It is possible that it draws on a 10th or 11th century saga, now lost. Waldef is the least courtly of all the romances of this period. The most important surviving romance from the 13th century is Guy de Warwick, a 13,000-line octosyllabic work written in the early to mid-13th century. This narrative recounts how the humble guy won the hand of Felice, the daughter of the Earl of Warwick, by performing brave deeds in her honor. However, he later repented of his violent past, embarked on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and upon his return, lived out his remaining years as a hermit at Guy's Cliff by the River Avon. The story has a strong historical streak and probably draws on fragmentary pre-conquest traditions about the family's past. It provides a foundation myth for the Earls of Warwick and may have been written to reinforce the Earl's reputation at a time when their fortunes were suffering decline. The poem enjoyed wide popularity in the Middle Ages and survives in a dozen or more manuscripts. When translated into English metrical verse in the 14th century, it reached an even wider audience. Another Anglo-Norman romance with a strong family context is Fouke Fitzwarren, which survives in a 14th century prose version, representing an original octosyllabic romance of the previous century. The story has its origins in the partly verifiable history of the Fitzwarren family of Whittington in Shropshire. The eponymous folk is sent as a young boy to the court of Henry VI, where he quarrels with the future King John, is stripped of his inheritance, and condemned to the life of an outlaw. The poem traces the story of his struggles with John and his men, his exploits in the Greenwood, his life on the move, and eventually his reconciliation with the tyrant, and one final adventure involving a giant in Ireland. With its emphasis on the struggle of good against evil, and its hero as an outlaw figure, the poem bears many similarities to the Robin Hood legends, which are likewise rooted in the social conditions of the early 13th century. Such romances were almost certainly written by chaplains connected with the aristocratic patrons whose families or distant ancestors formed the subject matter of the work. The principal themes considered were the challenges and preoccupations of aristocratic society. These age-old themes not only made for good adventure stories, but also formed the essence of life in a competitive, honor-based society. The world of insular romance was thus very different from that imagined in the fantastical fictionality of Arthurian romance. The Arthurian tales focused on courts and courtliness. Even when they were not about King Arthur himself, they centered on knights in his service, implicitly lending legitimacy to the notion of effective centralized monarchy. In contrast, the Anglo-Norman romances were more concerned with lordship and landholding, inheritance and dynastic progression, than with courts. They showed the closest interest in situations and administrative processes that resulted in challenges to royal authority. Typically, the hero of the romances was a landless bachelor who found himself deprived of his lands and facing a struggle to regain them. While marriage and family were important themes in many of the stories, love, however, was typically not. The subject matter of the romances suggests that their audience was found in baronial and knightly society, not in the refined atmosphere of royal courts. The world of the romances was one in which heroes blended into local history, and their lives were structured around ancestry and a sense of place. It is partly the emphasis on the hero's lands that gives romance literature its powerful sense of locality. All the romances show a strong affinity 
with a particular corner of England, whether it be Southampton or Warwick, Shropshire or East Anglia. What the poet sought to create was a fiction that combined a feeling for family and place with a storyline that addressed the concerns and challenges of aristocratic society. The keen interest which the Anglo-Norman aristocracy took in the past developed in a number of directions in the course of the 12th century. It led, on the one hand, to a fashionable interest in fictional romance and ancestral myth-making, while on the other hand, it found expression in a curiosity about the early history of England itself. The 12th century was probably the first to witness a substantial lay readership for history. This lively interest in England's past was the product of a very specific set of historical circumstances. The Anglo-Norman aristocracy, whose forebears had conquered England in 1066, knew very little about the country over which they had established mastery. The first generation of settlers had remained essentially Norman in outlook. Unsurprisingly, since they held lands on both sides of the channel. By the second and third generations, however, there was a shift in outlook as they came to regard themselves as more English than Anglo-Norman. A natural consequence of this shift of identification was a desire to learn more about England's past. The cataclysm of the conquest thus became a powerful stimulus to historical research. Oddly, the Anglo-Saxons had left very little historical writing for later generations to build on. Bede's Ecclesiastical History and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle were the only two sources of value. The learned men of the 12th century, therefore, had to undertake the bulk of their research themselves. Sometimes they worked in association with patrons in the lay aristocracy. William of Malmesbury, the greatest historian of the period, dedicated his Historia Novella to Robert, Earl of Gloucester, while Aelred of Revolux was encouraged in his writing by his friend Walter Espec, Lord of Helmsley. Sometimes they wrote principally to establish the antiquity of their own monastic houses or cathedral churches. Much of the historical writing of the 12th century took the form of conventional chronicles. William of Malmesbury's various works and Henry of Huntingdon's Historia Anglorum were all conceived in the established chronicle tradition. These were lengthy prose works in elegant Latin which looked in their different ways to classical antiquity for their models. One remarkable historical work, however, stands apart from this tradition. It is Geoffrey Guimard's Estoile des Anglais. Guimard's work is important for two reasons. First, it was written in French and not Latin, and is therefore likely to have been read by a predominantly lay audience. And second, it is in octosyllabic rhymed couplets, rather, rather than prose. The Estoire deserves respect as the first known verse romance history of England. Disappointingly, little is known about Gaimar himself. He is thought to have been a secular clerk of Norman extraction, and he probably had some connection with Walter Respect of Helmsley, for he says that he obtained a copy of Geoffrey of Monmouth's history through Walter's good offices, and he refers to Walter's kinsman, Nicholas de Tralee, a canon of York. Nicholas, he says, will vouch for the authenticity of his sources. In his epilogue, he helpfully identifies his patron for us, an aristocratic lady, Constance, wife of Ralph Fitzgilbert, who, according to Gaymar, could read French. Constance was connected with another female patron, Alice, widow of Robert de Condet, who commissioned a verse translation of the first 19 chapters of the Book of Proverbs, together with a scholastic commentary, a formidable work of 11,000 lines. Ralph Fitzgilbert was a baron of middling rank, whose main estates lay in Lincolnshire, but who had acquired lands in Hampshire, perhaps through marriage. He was the founder of Markby Priory and a benefactor of the priories of Kirkstead and Stixwood. Gamar shows himself particularly knowledgeable about those parts of the country in which his patron had interests. In the Estoir, then, we have a rare example of a vernacular history written for a patron in chivalric society. We are afforded an exceptional insight into the literary tastes of an elite 12th century readership. Gaimar tells us that he wrote his chronicle in 14 months, probably between March 1136 and April 1137. His sources were varied. For the earliest period, he used Geoffrey of Monmouth's history. For the middle period, covering the late 5th to the mid 10th centuries, he relied on the prose annals of the Anglo Saxon chronicle. 
For the century and three quarters from 959, he wrote largely independently, relying on various sources, some written and some oral. The latter apparently included informants whose ancestors had frequented the court, among them probably Ranulf, Earl of Chester. For the post-conquest period, his material is original, if disordered. Guimar's Estuar is a notably secular work. The affairs of the religious hardly figure at all. Its main concern is with aristocratic culture and politics, and in this area it broke significant new ground. Where Guimar was innovative was in his portrayal of the kings and noblemen of the past in chivalric terms. He took the chivalric values which he observed in the men around him and projected them back onto the fighting men of earlier times. Thus, he pictured King Alfred, an essentially heroic figure, as possessing the chivalric qualities of wisdom, mercy, and courtesy. He portrayed the 10th century King Edgar in a similar fashion, adding tellingly that Edgar had been more powerful than any king since Arthur. His strengths as an observer of chivalry are naturally most apparent in his portrayal of figures from the more recent past. In his account of Rufus's reign, he reversed the order of events at one point to highlight the story of Rufus's release of Count Helius of La Fleche as illustrating the king's qualities of mercy and magnanimity. Later, in his treatment of the death of King Malcolm of Scotland, he reports that Rufus took a tough line with Robert Mowbray, the king's slayer, but adds significantly that he refrained from mutilating or executing him, a mark of his chivalry. It has been suggested that Guimar's portrayal of Rufus in the Estuar is probably the first portrait of a chivalrous king in European history. If this is the case, as it may be, then it is significant that the book was written for a baronial family. In Guimar's work, we are afforded a valuable insight into the literary and social milieu in which chivalric history was created and represented. The genre of chivalric historical writing represented by Guimar's Estoir is illustrated by two other French verse chronicles to have come down to us from the late 12th century. One is Jordan Fantasma's history of the Anglo-Scottish War of 1173 to 1174 and the baronial rebellion of that year, and the other is Ambrose's eyewitness account of the Third Crusade. Jordan's chronicle is constructed in the manner of the old Chanson de Guest. It is a story of heroes and heroism, built around a grand, overarching theme, the failure of the rebellion against Henry VI because of the rebels' excess of pride. Surprisingly, the heroes, for all their failings, are the rebels, William, King of Scots, and David, Earl of Huntingdon. According to Jordan, the former was noble and brave, only drawn into the war with the English because he was ill-advised, while the latter is portrayed in even warmer tones as a most estimable man, better than any I saw, and someone who would never dream of robbing an abbey or church. It is possible that Jordan was especially sympathetic to Earl David because his doubling as an English noble made him a member of the International Chivalric Brotherhood. Ambroise Estoir, written a generation later, is the work of an enthusiastic supporter of the Third Crusade. Ambroise's hero is unsurprisingly the main hero of that crusade, King Richard himself. Ambroise constantly emphasizes Richard's bravery, stating that he was the bravest man in the world and that God knew his foresight and bravery. He portrays him as the ideal knight, noting that his deeds of chivalry were so great that men marveled. Ambroise describes his court as magnificent, mentioning that whenever he feasted, he used only the richest plate. His cups and dishes were of gold or silver, ornamented with figures and animals in bas relief or engraved, and studded with precious stones. Ambroise showed himself highly receptive to Richard's propaganda, reproducing stories almost certainly fed to him by Richard himself, which magnified the king's achievements. Yet he had little need to invent stories. To write romance history of the kind loved by his readers, he simply had to tell the story as it was. It is not altogether clear how extensive the audience was for works of this sort. In most cases, the manuscripts have come down to us in a mere handful of copies. By contrast, there are several dozen copies of Henry of Huntingdon's history and significant numbers of William of Malmesbury's main works. Of Geoffrey of Monmouth's history, there are as many as 200 copies. On the other hand, it is hard to judge the popularity of romance history entirely by the somewhat unreliable test of the number of extant manuscripts. 
Histories written by clerks for private patrons were bound to survive in fewer numbers than texts written in monasteries, which enjoyed institutional continuity. Aristocratic culture, it has been said, was a culture of display. In the Middle Ages, when literacy was limited, messages about status were communicated through visual displays. Great men showcased their importance before various audiences in diverse settings, such as baronial halls, churches, and on the highways. They also exhibited their greatness through various means. They dressed lavishly in public. For instance, in the Bayeux Tapestry, Duke William of Normandy is depicted wearing a garment of high status. Knights would typically be adorned in rich silk robes during royal knighting ceremonies. It was customary for the well-born and well-connected to maintain large households. When Becket became Henry II's chancellor in 1155, the size of his retinue, the magnificence of his household, and the numerous servants attending him drew attention. Both lay and ecclesiastical lords built castles not only for defense, but also to assert their status. In the Middle Ages, great lords had to appear great to maintain their status. The notion, inherited from the ancient world, was that outward appearance reflected inner worth. A man's position in the social hierarchy was judged by the grandeur of his public demeanor. In the 12th century, there was a steadily increasing range of means by which great men could communicate their social standing. Not only did such men have more money to spend, but they also felt a greater urge to spend it in ways that affirmed their separateness from others, such as townsmen, who had also acquired more disposable wealth. A notable development of the period was the growing use and refinement of aristocratic insignia. Emblems and devices once deployed exclusively in military context were now adopted in civilian settings to provide evidence of social status and position.